This is Adel Gasly. I'm going to present to you part 5 of the chapter about synchronous machines. In this part, I will cover the following topics. Principle of operation of synchronous motors, starting of synchronous motor, and then power torque characteristics. The difference between generator and motor operations in the equivalent circuit is in the direction of the armature current. In the motoring operation, the armature current direction is going inside the armature while that of a generator is leaving the armature. So the equation of the induced back EMF EF is obtained from the KVL as shown here. The main difference between the generator and motor operation so is mainly the minus sign of the armature current that is shown here. Now, considering the terminal voltage vector phase angle as the reference zero angle, we can express this equation in phasor form as shown here, where delta is the phase angle between the induced back EMF, EF, and the terminal voltage VT, and phi is the power factor angle. Now, let's draw the phasor diagram during motoring operation for the lagging power factor case first. As usual, we start by drawing the terminal voltage on the horizontal axis. Then we draw the current vector considering that it is lagging behind the terminal voltage. Then we draw the voltage drop across the armature resistance and the voltage drop across the synchronous reactance. By summing all these vectors as per the above phasor equation, we can obtain the back EMF vector as shown here. Notice that the back EMF is smaller in amplitude than the terminal voltage and has a negative phase angle delta, which is relative to the terminal voltage. Now for the leading power factor case, we can proceed in the similar way and we can obtain the following phasor diagram. Notice that in this case, the back EMF is also lagging the terminal voltage with an angle delta. So we can conclude that during motoring operation, the phase angle delta between the back EMF and the terminal voltage is always negative. So by comparing the generator and motor phase diagrams, we can conclude that the angle delta is always positive during generator operation mode and always negative during motor operation mode. Now we'll see why a synchronous motor has a problem during starting. In other words, why the three-phase synchronous motor has zero starting torque. Now if the rotor field poles are excited by the field current and the stator terminals are connected to AC supply, the motor will not start, instead it will vibrate. The stator field is rotating so fast that the rotor poles cannot catch up or lock onto it because of the high inertia of the rotor, which starts very slowly. For instance, in this case, if the stator flux is rotating at 3000 RPM clockwise and the rotor is initially at standstill at one time T0, the dipoles on the rotor will have opposite polarities and will tend to attract each other. This creates a torque that will push the rotor rotation clockwise. But since the state of flux is much faster, after a certain time t1, the polarity of the stator dipoles will change and we will have a situation where the poles of same polarities will repulse each other, so they create an opposite torque on the rotor which tends to rotate anti-clockwise. Therefore, the rotor will not be able to start, but instead it will vibrate in the same standstill position. Two methods are used to overcome this problem of synchronous motor starting. The first one is to start with a variable frequency supply. In this case, the motor is started at low frequency supply and this will make the stator field rotate at low speed and the rotor poles can follow it and as the frequency increases, the motor speed or rotor speed will increase also. 
This method is costly and can be used only if the motor operates at variable speed. A second method is to start as an induction motor. In this method, an additional winding is mounted on the rotor called a damper winding. The motor will start as an induction motor. It has a kind of cage like an induction motor. This cage is mounted on the rotor on the top of the field windings. In this case, the field winding is initially not energized. When the stator winding is energized, the machine will start exactly like an induction motor. When the machine reaches, or the rotor reaches, a speed close to the synchronous speed, the field winding is then energized and the rotor will then lock to into its synchronous speed. Therefore, there will be no current in the rotor cage, so no interference with the motor operation during normal operation. So the cage is only used during starting of the synchronous machine. The following movie describes this synchronous motor starting issue and how damper winding can be used to start the machine as an induction motor. But if the rotor has got no initial rotation, situation is quite different. North pole of the rotor will obviously get attracted by south pole of RMF and will start to move in the same direction. But since the rotor has got some inertia, this starting speed will be very low. By this time, south pole of RMF will be replaced by a north pole, so it will give repulsive force. As a net effect, rotor won't be able to start, or synchronous motors are not inherently self-starting. To make synchronous motors self-start, a squirrel cage arrangement is cleverly fitted through pole tips. At the starting, rotor field coils are not energized, so with revolving magnetic field, electricity is induced in squirrel cage bars and rotor starts rotating just like an induction motor. When the rotor has achieved its maximum speed, rotor field coils are energized. So as discussed earlier, poles of rotor gets locked with poles of RMF and will start rotating at synchronous speed. When rotor rotates at synchronous speed, relative motion between squirrel cage and RMF is zero. This means zero current and force on squirrel cage bars. Thus, it will not affect synchronized operation of motor. Recall that the three-phase apparent power delivered by the generator to an infinite bus is equal to three times the armature voltage, armature phase voltage, times the conjugate of the armature current. But if you use the line voltage and current, we you have to use square root three instead of three. The phase representation of the apparent power has a real and imaginary component representing the active power and reactive power respectively. This phase diagram shows the lagging power factor case and this phase diagram shows the leading power factor case. Note that the conjugate of the current phaser IA is used to conform with the convention that lagging reactive power is considered as positive and leading reactive power is considered as negative. The previous power equations can be simplified by assuming that the armature resistance is small compared to synchronous reactance. Thus, Ra can be taken equal to zero and Zs equal to Xs. So we can rewrite the power equations as shown here. Notice that the active power is the sine function of the angle delta, while the reactive power is a cosine function. The torque equations can be deduced from the active power equation and dividing it by the angular speed, omega s.
So these two equations are very important equations describing the power and torque characteristics of a synchronous machine. So you can use these two equations to plot the active power and developer torque as a function of the angle delta as given by this figure. Notice that the maximum power and maximum torque occur at an angle delta equal to 90 degrees. Above 90 degrees, the machine becomes unstable because the torque produced cannot keep the rotor of the machine synchronized with the stator flux. Pmax and Tmax are static stability limits. So the maximum torque is called the pull-out torque because above this torque the machine pulls out of synchronism and its speed will decrease to zero. Therefore, the angle delta is called the power or torque angle because by controlling this angle we can control the power and the torque of the synchronous machine. By increasing the excitation current from IF1 to IF2, the excitation voltage increases from EF1 to EF2, as shown in this graph. So the maximum power that can be delivered by the machine increases. The pull-out torque also increases. If the load real power is unchanged and equal to Pm, as shown in this graph, the power angle decreases from delta 1 to delta 2, which means that for constant power delivery, if we increase the excitation, the power angle will decrease to keep the same power. This figure displays graphically the variation of the active power P versus the power angle for both motor and generator operating modes. Here you can notice that the positive angle refers to generator action and negative angles refer to motor actions. The regions shaded with gray color are unstable regions. If a synchronous motor tends to pull out of synchronism because of excessive load, the field current can be increased to develop higher torque to prevent loss of synchronism. Similarly, in a synchronous generator, if the prime mover tends to drive the machine to super synchronous speed by excessive driving torque, the field can be increased to produce more counter torque to oppose such a tendency. As the speed remains constant in a synchronous machine, the speed torque characteristic is a straight line parallel to the torque axis. As long as the machine torque is below the pull-out torque, the speed will remain unchanged. Let's investigate the apparent power characteristic and define its per-phase complex locus when the power angle is varied during motor and generator operations. For that, we consider the per-phase values of the apparent power that is expressed as shown by these equations. Now, if you plot the phase representation of the power on the P and Q axis, then we can obtain this representation. From the expression of P and Q, we can notice that the sine and cosine terms can represent a circular locus when delta is varied. However, this locus is not centered at the origin but is shifted below on the vertical axis with an imaginary coordinate of minus vt squared over xs. So if you consider a variable sx as given by this equation, we can write the per phase apparent power vector as shown here. Now if you vary delta from 0 to 360 degrees, we can draw the complex power locus per phase as shown here. Notice that is a circle centered at point 0 minus vt square over xs. Now since delta can practically be varied from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees only, then there is a limit for the power locus for stable steady state operation. This line delimits the maximum power locus, that is the steady state stability limit. All shaded area in gray color 
is an unstable steady-state region. So the machine can operate only on the upper part of the locus for steady-state stable operation. In summary, we have seen that the power and torque equations can be expressed as a function of the power angle delta as shown here. The maximum torque is called the pull-out torque because the machine cannot deliver more than that torque and if the required torque is higher than this torque, the rotor will pull out of synchronism. For motor operation, delta is negative and varies within the steady state stable interval from minus 90 degrees to zero. And for generator operation, delta is positive and its steady state stable operation interval is from zero to 90 degrees. This is the end of this part. Thank you for watching this video.